Well, thank you very much, and it is a pleasure to be here. And I've heard one or two of the earlier TEDs, and I think TED is really about, it's really about the power of dreams. And I want to talk to you about my dream and how I envisage it going in the future, how I want the fulfillment of my dream. So I want to talk to you about the new space era. So I actually have a confession. My name is Maggie Adair in Pocock, and I want to be an astronaut. Now, I say this and I hang my head because it is slightly embarrassing, but now I want you guys to embarrass yourselves as well. Could you put up your hands if you would like to go into space, if it was sort of cheap enough and, let's say, as safe as travelling by an aircraft, as travelling by plane? Could you put your hands up? Okay. I see more and more hands are coming up. Well, actually, wow, that's a good turnout. <laughs> because I usually, I always think there's about 50% of people, I think there are two types of people. People like me who have a strong desire to get out there, and people like my husband who think it's just crazy and we shouldn't be going out there. And actually, from that um, hand count, I think there was probably about 60%, 70% of people who wanted to get out into space. Now, as a black dyslexic kid growing up in London, uh, coming from a, sort of a, a single-parent family, people often ask me, why did you want to go into space? And I can answer that quite simply. It's these guys. <laughs> Now, for those of you who aren't so familiar, actually, this is my daughter, so you can hear her in the background. It's like, that's my toy. <laughs> this is a clanger. And I used to watch the clangers when I was about three years old, and I was mesmerized by them. I thought they were fantastic. And so as I grew up, um, I, I decided that I wanted to go and visit the clangers. But it seemed like a viable opportunity. It seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Because I grew up at the end of the 1960s, and I heard about people like Yuri Gagarin, the first person to leave the surface of the Earth and travel into space. People like Neil Armstrong, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> These were the words reverberating in my ears as I was a child growing up. So it seemed like a natural thing to do to become a, an astronaut. And um, as I grew up, you see, this, many people have these dreams, and they, they dream of being about firefighters or ballerinas, and they grow out of them. I was never that sophisticated. I never grew out of my dream. <laughs> and I must admit, this dream has influenced my whole life. Um, I, so um, I was a black dyslexic kid in London growing up. I wasn't doing very well at school, but I discovered science. And when I discovered science, I thought, fantastic, science is what puts people into space. So I became a scientist. And through various convolutions, I became eventually a space scientist. But I had other jobs on the way. For a, a short time, I was actually working for the Ministry of Defence, you know, the MOD, in the UK. And I was working on an aircraft. And to me, this got me slightly closer to my dream. Because when I was looking at sort of back in time, most of the early astronauts were, you know, those guys with the crew cuts and you know, fighter pilots, you know, standing outside their aircraft looking cool. This is me trying to do the same thing, not quite succeeding. I think I really needed a pair of dark glasses to succeed. But this was my dream, and it was getting closer. Then I started doing sort of lots of science communication work. I wanted more kids to take up science, because to me, science is fantastic. Science tells us about the world, it tells us about everything. But um, I was finding it very hard to recruit scientists. So I started getting out there and doing television programs. And so what I decided was perhaps I could combine my career as a space scientist with my career with TV. So I thought one of the best ways of getting me into space was doing this. I wanted to combine the idea of Big Brother. Now, I think many people are familiar with Big Brother. It's been going on for a number of years now. But I think Big Brother's getting a bit stale. So I want to combine Big Brother with interplanetary travel. <laughs> I'm thinking of Big Brother on a whole new scale. <laughs> so what my idea is, is to put a Big Brother spaceship together, and that spaceship is going to travel to Mars. Now, on this spaceship, I want to put approximately 10 passengers. But most importantly, I want those passengers to come from all around the world. And um, then I want to have real-time coverage, just like Big Brother, real-time coverage on the spacecraft. Now, as you can imagine, this is an interesting idea, but it has a number of challenges. Now, the first challenge, and probably the biggest challenge to a mission to Mars at the moment, is the cost. Because I reckon a mission to Mars will cost of the order of a few hundred billion dollars. Now, unfortunately, there's no country, well, there aren't many countries on planet Earth at the moment that have that sort of money, so we need to find it from elsewhere. So, but the whole idea of the Big Brother spaceship is almost self-funding, because if we select people from all around the world, that means we are going to be, uh, we can actually sell the television rights across the world. And I think if we actually are all part of the selection process, people will actually watch this program, we can sell the television rights quite successfully and make quite a bit of money out of it. 
Now, there are sort of a number of examples of doing this. Um, when I came up with this idea about six years ago, they just sold the, um, the premiership football rights for maybe five or six billion dollars. And another example is the Olympics, which we had last year. The television rights were sold to that for multiple ten billion dollars. So I reckon we can get quite a bit of money by doing something like this. But there's another very fundamental problem with a Big Brother spaceship, and that's this. <laughs> Eviction. Because <laughs> if you can imagine, um, Dr. Maggie Adair and Pocock, please make your way to the airlock. You have been evicted from the Big Brother spaceship. Have a nice day. <laughs> That's really not going to work. So I had to rethink my ideas. And my current plan is, for the Big Brother spaceship, um, the, there'll be ten contestants going out, but only two will return back to Earth. <laughs> Now, until my daughter was born about three years ago, I wanted to be one of the eight that stayed behind. It was my retirement plan. Because if you look at Mars today, we have water on Mars. We're finding out more and more about this planet, and it looks as if people could live on Mars. Um, see, when I'm sort of in my 70s, you know, virtually in my dotage, I reckon what a wonderful way to end my career, having a whole planet to explore. So um, I need to make sure my daughter's well grown up, but it's still my retirement plan at the moment. So my argument is that there have been three phases of space to date. And it's, sort of the, it's C cubed. It has been confrontation. It has been collaboration. And in future, it's going to be commercialization. And I think we're just entering the age of commercialization. So just to give a quick overview, confrontation. Space had a very dark past. Um, space was born out of the Second World War. Now, the problem is, war is a very, very effective tool for technology generation. And that's exactly what happened in the Second World War. They came up with rockets, and those rockets um, uh, were used to lob missiles from one place to the other. But then people realized that space could perhaps be used for something else. And we had the space race, where the Americans, oh, sorry, the Russians got Sputnik into space, and the Americans were horrified, and they got their satellite into space. So it was, again, confrontation, but it was showing technological superiority. And then people realized that there were other things we could do with space. This is the first image taken from space. And it's actually a picture of planet Earth, although you have to squint your eyes a bit to see it. <laughs> but we realized that we could spy on each other with space. So space became useful, but it became useful in a confrontational way. Then came the era of collaboration. Here, we suddenly realized that Space is incredibly expensive for one country to do. So in 1975, we had the formation of the European Space Agency. Things started to clump together, so you had sort of a greater sum of money to do things in space. And this is an epic moment when a, Soyuz, a USSR Soyuz spacecraft and a Russian Apollo spacecraft made a link in space. And you got that, this is the handshake that happened between the USSR and the Americans, and it happened for the first time in space. So that was sort of a collaboration. And this is the era that I've been working in, the collaborative era. And it's wonderful. It harks back to those Star Trek days, where you have you know, people from all over the world traveling together, fighting aliens. And it's been a fantastic um, opportunity for me to work in that mode. But it also has a problem as well. Because when you do things by committee, I'm a terrible committee member, because when you do things by committee, things get quite slow. Progress is slow. People say, well, you know, why aren't we living on the moon by now? I think it's because we're doing things by collaboration. So what I want to do is move on to the third era of space, and that's the era of commercialization. And that's the era I'd like to reckon we're in at the moment. Because with commercialization, suddenly we're getting the democratization of space. It's not about what countries want. It's, not about, it's more about what individuals want. It's that show of hands that shows that people want to go into space. And when this happens, the technology grows to meet that demand. So I'm excited about this era. And it's not just about people in space. It's also about spacecraft themselves. Um, Go back 30 years, and spacecraft were generally owned by countries. It was government putting spacecraft into space. Then corporations started putting spacecraft into space for telecommunications and things like this. But now we're in an era where you can almost actually buy your own spacecraft. There's something called a CubeSat, which will fit into the palm of my hand, and students across the world are working on these things and launching them into space. So, as in all TEDs, I think I've got to make a few predictions for the future. And I want to base my predictions on um, technology of the past. So when you look at air travel, air travel was the um, elite. It was the luxury item for a few people in the past. But these costs have, dro have dropped radically. Over the last 30 years, um, the, co the costs have dropped by 50%. If you look at um, 
computers, hard disks, once only owned by large corporations. Now we've got computers in our mobile phones that are owned by everybody, and the price has dropped. So I'm anticipating exactly the same thing to happen for space. Now, I don't think it's going to be as good as the, um, the drop in um, hard disk prices, and I hope it's going to be better um, than uh, the price of flights, but I think that price will drop. So more and more of us will get the opportunity to go into space because the technology will be meeting the demand. We demand to go into space, and the technology will meet that. We've been waiting. Some people might argue we've been waiting, making this demand for a long time, but I think the demand is coming into fruition, and more and more technology out there is reaching this. This is a spacecraft called Skylon. It, to me, it looks quite sexy because it looks it's a step straight out of the 1950s. But a, a British company called Reaction Engines is designing this spacecraft. It's getting cheaper and cheaper, and it's, we're going to use this technology to get us all into space. But I think it can do more for us than that, because when we all start going into space, suddenly we'll see our planet as a whole. It will be more like the Star Trek scenario. We won't see so many borders. We won't see so many divisions. We'll see ourselves as one globe and one people. That's my hope. Thank you very much.